I'd encourage you to take your Bibles and open to Mark chapter 10 as we continue our study through Mark's gospel. In our text this morning, Jesus tells a rich man that if he wants to enter the kingdom of God, he must sell everything he has, give the proceeds to the poor, and then follow Jesus. Does this make Christianity a works-based religion? Is that what Jesus is teaching here? Of course not. The point is that no one can enter the kingdom of God on their own merit. Uh, Childlike faith and dependence on God are necessary for entrance into God's kingdom. And a love for riches and a trust in riches represents a huge obstacle to faith, to the faith that's vital to inherit eternal life. So so let's begin uh, by looking at uh, verse 17 of Mark chapter 10. It says, as he, as Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So so Jesus is setting out, ultimately we know, to Jerusalem and to the cross. He's on his way there. But as he's setting out on this journey, a man runs up and kneels before him. And and, and as you know, this episode is often called the uh, story of the rich young ruler, Because Matthew says he was young, and Luke refers to him as a ruler, uh, probably a ruler in a synagogue. Mark doesn't include those things. But several things about this influential man would have shocked the bystanders of that day. First, he ran up to Jesus. Well, Middle Eastern men of status did not run in public. I mean, to run, you had to gather up your robes and expose your legs, and that was shameful, that was undignified, and so running was frowned upon. It says he also knelt before Jesus. He assumed a humble position in the presence of the one whom the uh, religious establishment hated as a false prophet, who they wanted to destroy him. But he comes to Jesus. He kneels before him. He calls Jesus good teacher, which is also very unusual. Uh, The phrase is used nowhere else in Judaism. And this man, I believe, probably thinks of himself as good as well. And he's asking his question from one good man to somebody he views as another good man. And what is this question? He wants to know how to ensure that his goodness will pay off in eternal life. Uh, His question is synonymous with saved in verse 26, entering the kingdom of God, verses 23, 24, and 25. But, but the man realizes that this is not guaranteed. So he asks Jesus, what shall I do? And, and oftentimes his question is, is seen as, as negative. He's, he's seeking to be saved by doing something. He's seeking to be saved by earning or, or meriting his own salvation through works instead of through faith in God. But notice that Jesus responds with what the man must do as well, right? And so I don't think the point here uh, is faith versus works. No, the point is this man's love for riches over his love for God. His trust in his riches over his humble dependence on God. And the grammar that's used here indicates He expects Jesus to give him some great deed that he could do that would settle things with God once and for all. And so he asks, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You know, that's that's a great question. That's a question we should all ask. But notice Jesus does not immediately answer that question. Instead, he responds to the man's calling him good teacher. Look at verse 18. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know, that answer of Jesus has caused some people to think that Jesus is saying he is not good and he's not God. Okay, that's not what it's saying. That's false, okay? This isn't a statement about who Jesus is. It's a question that sets the stage for Jesus' teaching that follows. This man is about to claim that he's kept God's commandments. And Jesus is here proactively challenging his idea of goodness. And he's going to redefine it in relation to God himself. So so good here is absolute. It's not relative. You know, people can be more good or less good, but only God is absolutely, perfectly, and eternally good. 
And in comparison to God's perfection, there is no one who is good. There is no one who is worthy of eternal life. And, and, and so Jesus turns to this man and, and he responds, how can you address any human teacher as good? Only God is truly good. And by doing this, I think Jesus is nullifying the man's claim about his own goodness before he's even made it. And Jesus is setting up the conclusion that no one can earn or deserve their salvation. But Jesus continues. He points the man to the second table of the Ten Commandments, the, the commandments dealing with a person's relationship with other people. We read in verse 19, Jesus says, You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Okay, as I read those, some of you, a light bulb went off and said, huh, one of those is not in the Ten Commandments, right? Do not defraud is not one, uh, do not defraud isn't one of the Ten Commandments. And, and for some reason here, Jesus has replaced do not covet with do not defraud. And it may be to apply the command more directly to the rich, whose wealth means they're, they're less likely to covet. They're more likely to have gained their riches through deception or defraud. Because many people in that day and age, just as many people in our day and age, think that riches can only be had by defrauding others of their fair share. Or it could simply mean that defrauding is viewed as the action that follows the internal sin of coveting. Whatever the case, Jesus lays out this commands, and how does the man respond? Verse 20, the man said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Sounds kind of arrogant, doesn't it? I, I, I'm not so sure it's arrogant. Uh, Jesus' response in verse 21 shows us that it's not really arrogance, but he's expressing confidence that he's lived a righteous life before God. He, far from being convicted by his inability to attain to the perfection of the law, this man is convinced he's kept the law. And he's no doubt thinking of the outward compliance of the law, which was the norm in that day. He, he kept the letter of the law rather than the true heart righteousness that Jesus speaks about in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere. You know, Paul expressed similar confidence in his own ability to keep the law before he came to Christ. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 talks about that. B but the man, even though he thinks he's kept God's commandments, he senses there's something lacking. He's pursuing this issue with Jesus about eternal life. And, and so look at the first part of verse 21 there. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. Stop there. Uh, Mark's the only one that mentions this of Jesus' prolonged gaze at the man and love for the man. In other words, Jesus doesn't sneer at his claims to have obeyed the law. He loves him. But then Jesus drops a bombshell on him. Jesus says to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Okay, you know, you know, I always enjoyed math, and this always disturbs me, right? Jesus says, you lack one thing, and then what does he do? He, he lists four things, right? It doesn't add up to me, but that's okay. The four combine to make up one thing, if you will. That is, everyone must give up even one's own life to live wholly for God. God must be most important. And, and though shocking in, in context... This is not a new teaching from Jesus. He's already taught that, that being his disciple means what? Denying yourself, taking up the cross, following him. But why does Jesus, I mean, this man comes and asks Jesus, what must I do for eternal life? Why does Jesus command him to get rid of his riches, to give to the poor? I think it's simply because he knew that materialism, wealth, riches, occupied the place of God in this man's life. And because of this, the man was living in, in a perpetual transgression of the first commandment against having other gods beside the true God. Not only that, but the, the man's great wealth prevented the helpless, childlike dependence which Jesus has just said was necessary for entrance into his kingdom. This man's first love was his wealth, and it was keeping him from fulfilling 
the greatest commandment, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He, he loved his riches more than he loved God. He was trusting in his riches rather than trusting in God. And so Jesus tells him, go, give everything away to the poor. Follow me. You know, at the very beginning of Mark, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he pointed to the two things necessary to receive the kingdom of God. What were they? Repent and believe, right? And, and Jesus' words here to this man recalls these things. This man must repent of his love for riches. He must put his faith in Jesus instead. His problem is he's trusting in himself. He's trusting in what he has. He's trusting in his so-called righteousness, his personal resources. And as we saw last week, to inherit eternal life, one must become like a child, right? Empty, without status, fully dependent. And Jesus says, if you'll do these things, you'll have treasure in heaven. You know, he's not referring to mansions or wealth in heaven, no. But treasures in heaven, a relationship with God that lasts for eternity. And so the man has asked his question. Jesus has given the answer. What will the man do? Verse 22. At these words, he was saddened. And he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Mark hasn't told us he's rich until this point in time. But the man's sincerity in asking the question is, is evident because now he leaves sad and grieving. He, he, he left saddened, which carries the, the idea of shock, dismay. He couldn't believe what Jesus had told him. Uh, the verb here appears only one other time in the New Testament where it's used of a gloomy, threatening sky before a storm. That's his countenance. He doesn't question what Jesus tells him. He doesn't quibble with it. He doesn't argue with it. He just turns and walks away. When it became clear that what Jesus was offering was going to cost him all his possessions, he decided the price was too high, even for eternal life. He was guilty of an idol in his life, worshiping his wealth, and God tolerates no rivals. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 6? No one can serve two masters, right? For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And so earthly wealth was this man's God. And he leaves without salvation, without eternal life, because the power of wealth had such a grip on him. You know, the truth of the matter is the blessings of riches become a curse when they become an obstacle to a right relationship with God. Uh, unlike children who simply receive what God gives, this rich young man, this rich young ruler, thought he could do what Jesus required. But he went away sad when Jesus set the bar higher than he was willing to go. As a side note, do you ever wonder what ever happened to this man? Did he ever come to know Christ? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. I, I found it interesting. One commentator said it's possible that Mark... The author of the gospel was this rich young ruler. I don't know how he came up with that. I, I see no evidence of it, but it's fun to think about. So Jesus has this conversation with this ruler. The man turns, he leaves, because he didn't want to give up what he had. Jesus then turns to his disciples, and he gives a commentary on what's been played out right before them. Look at verses 23 and 24. Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. So, so, so it begins, Jesus looked around. He, it signifies, the word signifies a, a commanding survey of the situation, as though Jesus looks at his disciples to see whether they're going to follow the rich man's example. And then Jesus states the difficulty that the rich have in entering the kingdom of God. 
And, and then the, uh, the disciples express shock at this, and, and he repeats the statement, and then he drives home his point with a, a shocking analogy in verse 25, which we'll get to. But, but the disciples are amazed at this dialogue he had with this man. And, and their amazement probably arose because of the common Jewish view that riches were a sign of God's favor and blessing. After all, you know, Proverbs 10, for example, says it is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich, right? You know, many people have this same viewpoint today. If, if somebody is blessed monetarily or, or with wealth or a ministry is blessed this way, they, obvi- they, they immediately assume, well, they're being blessed because they're doing what God wants. That's not always true, is it? Jesus never promises wealth and prosperity to us. What does he promise to us? Persecution, hardship. And in this text, we see financial wealth can make salvation difficult for somebody because wealth gives that false sense of security. Well, what did Paul command Timothy? 1 Timothy 6, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited, not to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. And so the danger of wealth and riches is that we can be consumed with the things of this world. That is our priority. That is our focus. And where our treasure is what? That's where our heart is, right? John issued a similar warning in 1 John 2 when he said, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world. Okay, as I, as I said, the, the Jews in Jesus' day believed in an ancient form of a prosperity theology that equated God's blessing with material prosperity. And to the Jewish mind... It was inconceivable that riches could be a barrier to the kingdom of God. In their religious system, it should be easy for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, not impossible. And so we need to hear what Jesus is saying here. Wealth, riches, material things can be a handicap. You know, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, he warned, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, Jesus frequently spoke about the destructive power of riches throughout his time. And that's what he's doing here. What does he say? He says, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And then he says, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus calls his disciples children here. Uh, This only occurs here in Mark, and it's a very affectionate tone. And he may be alluding back to those who have to become like children to enter the kingdom of God that he just talked about in the prior text. But did you notice in the second statement, He leaves the wealth out of the equation. It's simply how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because all of us as humans want to do something to be saved. We want to have some, you know, we earn it, we deserve it, whatever the case. We, We want to do something so that we might be saved. And the disciples' reaction shows they hadn't broken free from the legalistic system that they had been raised in. And if Jesus' statements were shocking to him, the analogy he now gives them is even more so. He says in verse 25, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You know, the difficulty of entering the kingdom of God that Jesus clearly states has resulted in all sorts of attempts to soften it, okay? What does he say? He says, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. There's been all sorts of explanations for this phrase. Uh, Perhaps the most famous one, and you've probably heard it, is the claim that there was a, a small gate leading into Jerusalem known as the needle's eye gate. And a camel could pass through this gate only by having all its baggage removed and then crawling on its knees through this gate. 
And if that was the case, Jesus would be teaching the rich, the wealthy uh, can enter the kingdom of God only by unburdening themselves of their love of riches and come humbly to God. The problem with that whole interpretation is there's no evidence whatsoever for the existence of such a gate. And this theory was first suggested by an 11th century Byzantine commentator. Okay? Another proposal follows a few late manuscripts that read rope instead of camel. The Greek words are, are similar. But that doesn't help much either. Have you ever tried to put a rope through the eye of a needle? It doesn't work either. I mean, it's a less absurd image, but it's still impossible. Jesus meant what he said here. And, and there's several rabbinic parallels to this uh, in the uh, Babylonian Talmud, which was uh, put together in Mesopotamia. They talked about an elephant passing through the eye of a needle. Well, the elephant was the largest animal in Mesopotamia. The camel was the largest animal in Israel. So the largest animal, the smallest opening, the eye of a needle. And the image of a camel trying to squeeze through one is absurd, right? It's impossible. It can't be done. And, and so in one sense, I think Jesus' statement is certainly a, an intentional ex exaggeration, he, meaning to shock the disciples. But in another sense, it's not a huge exaggeration. Because the point Jesus makes, again in verse 27, is that it's impossible to enter the kingdom of God without divine intervention. Impossible. You cannot do it. And so the obvious point here isn't that salvation is difficult for the rich or for anyone, but that it's humanly impossible for everyone by any means, including the wealthy. You know, we like to look at passages like this and think, oh, you know, this doesn't apply to me. I'm not rich. I'm not wealthy. This applies to other people. Well, the truth of the matter is we're all wealthy, right? You know, we, we like to think that the rich are always those who have more than we do, right? But we have everything we need and more, do we not? We have every, I mean, for most of the world, we live in luxury. And this passage has something to say to all of us. Uh, what we do with our wealth, our possessions, shows our spiritual health. And, and Jesus regards possessions here as an almost insurmountable obstacle that, that prevents one from giving oneself completely to God. So, so what are we to do? Are we to sell everything we have and give it to the poor? Is that... What Jesus commands us here? Well, we have to rid ourselves of dependence on wealth. We depend on God, right? Uh, we must invest the, whatever God has given us into his work in such a way that it affects our lifestyle even. In other words, there should be some things we don't buy, some places we don't go, some pleasures we forego because we've given so much to God. And the Bible has a lot to say about all this, but, but his point here, no rich person can enter the kingdom of God while trusting in their riches. No poor person can enter the kingdom of God while trusting in anything except Jesus. But fortunately, what's impossible for us as humans has been made possible by God, right? 26 and 27. They were then even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Uh, you know, the, the disciples' minds are just being blown here. They're more astonished. They ask, then who can be saved? If this is true, if it's hard for a rich person to be saved, it's impossible for a rich, who can be saved then? If this man, who, who's apparently kept the commandments his whole life, who's been blessed with great riches, if this man cannot be saved, then who can be? And, and once again, saved is synonymous with inheriting eternal life, with entering the kingdom of God. And, and it's a great, great question. Who then can be saved? Well, sinners by our own power, by our own will, by our own efforts cannot save ourselves. It's only a sovereign act of God that can change the heart. And so when sinners, by the work of the Spirit, reach the point 
where they desire to repent, where they desire to be saved, having acknowledged their guilt, they cry out to God and ask him graciously to forgive their sins and save them through Jesus Christ. Their only plea, like the repentant tax collector, is what? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus' answer here is the climax to which this whole episode has been building. What is impossible for human beings is possible with God. Though no one can be saved by their own efforts, God has provided a way of salvation. That way, though, though not given specifically here, we know is the gift of salvation available through Jesus Christ, the Son of Man who will give his life as a ransom for many. And so in contrast to the rich man's failure to repent and, and give up everything and believe and follow Jesus, Peter now speaks up. And he says, we as disciples have already done that. Verse 28, Peter began to say to him, behold, we have left everything and followed you. You know, it's curious why Peter says we have left everything. It seems Peter still owned a home. It seems he still owned a fishing boat. This seems to tell us that Jesus doesn't call on everyone to give up everything they own to follow him in the sense that he asked this man to. Since Jesus doesn't deny Peter's claim here, it seems that giving up all means sacrificing those things that represent a roadblock to faith in God, to faith in Jesus. And if there's any inappropriate pride in Peter's remark here, Mark doesn't highlight it. And Jesus' response affirms that, that Peter and the disciples represent the contrast to the rich man's failure. And so Jesus moves on in verse 29 and 30, and he says to his disciples, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Uh, Jesus here is promising his disciples their sacrifice is not for nothing. The things they have left, the things they have forsaken, including home, family, property, they parallel the things that are gained, right, a hundredfold, Except that father isn't mentioned in the latter list, is it? Uh, why? I don't know. Maybe because as believers, we all have a father in heaven. And it's also curious to me, while parents and siblings and children are mentioned here, spouses are not. Maybe because Jesus has just taught about the permanence of marriage. It doesn't matter. But notice that these things are all given up for what? Jesus says, for my sake and for the sake of the gospel. Uh, once again, uh, the close identification with Jesus in the gospel, with the good news, the kingdom of God. The kingdom arrives through his life, his death, his resurrection. And, and Jesus says, uh, because you've done that, the gains are, are both in, the, in both eras of salvation. In this present age and in the age to come. So, so eternal life in the age to come is clear enough. We understand that. Well, we don't understand it, but we think we do. But in what sense do, does the believer gain homes and families and farms in the present age? Well, the likely answer is that as believers, as Christians, we are together as one family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Our possessions are ultimately God's possessions, and so we willingly share with those in need amongst us. Uh, we see this in the early church, don't we? Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4. And for any Christian who's, who's experienced the fellowship and hospitality of fellow believers in some other part of the world understands Jesus' words here. We have a family wherever we go. And it might be significant that early in Mark's gospel, Jesus identify, identifies his followers as his true mother and true brothers and true sisters. All believers are part of the church, are part of the body of Christ. And, and while many will lose their earthly families when they become Christians, they find they've gained a spiritual family. They're given many fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers in Christ. And, and that mutual caring has marked the church since its very beginning on the day of Pentecost. You know, on that day when, when the church was born, travelers 
came from Jewish settlements all around the known world. And after hearing the gospel and after their conversion, these new believers didn't want to go home because there were no churches at home. The only church was in Jerusalem, right? And so some of them stayed. Some of them stayed there permanently in the homes of the believers who were already there. They fed them. They housed them. They loved them. They cared for them. Uh, years later, Paul would travel all over the Mediterranean region collecting an offering to take back to Jerusalem church so it could continue to care for the needy believers there. But Jesus includes the statement, you're going to receive all these things along with persecutions. May reflect the realities of those that Mark was writing to. Remember, he was writing to believers in Rome, that Peter was, was there. It doesn't mean this phrase was added by Mark. No, not at all. Jesus repeatedly uh, predicted not only his own suffering, but also the suffering of his followers. In the present age, here upon this earth, though the blessings of salvation are already present, they are also not yet, right? As Jesus' followers, we must be prepared to suffer as he suffered. Yet the certainty of ultimate reward, eternal life in the age to come, should provide comfort, should provide consolation. And so what the rich young ruler came seeking is the certain inheritance of those who forsake all to follow Jesus in faith. In contrast to the rich and powerful who have... Oh, I'm supposed to read verse 31, aren't I? Thank you. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And so in contrast to the, the rich and the powerful who appear to be first in this present age, stand the disciples who will be persecuted, who have forsaken everything to follow Jesus. In terms of spiritual realities, they're receiving far more in this present age and eternal life in the age to come. Many who are first will be last and the last first. You know, to American Christians, this is one of the perhaps most challenging and difficult passages in the Bible. Because Jesus' teaching here stands in stark contrast uh, to those who advocate a, a prosperity gospel, right? In which wealth is seen as a sure sign of God's blessing. Uh, even those who, who, who know the air of that theology find this rich man's plight uncomfortably close to home. And as I, I, I mentioned, there's a number of ten, uh, attempts to avoid the pl plain meaning of this text, the invention of the gate, the, the changing of the words. Uh, others explain this away by assuming that there are two levels of discipleship and that Jesus' radical call is for those who want that higher level. The rest of us are down here, right? Uh, it misses the point of the past. That's not what Jesus is teaching. What he's teaching concerns the most fundamental issue for every believer, whether it's called eternal life, entrance into the kingdom, or salvation. That's what this is about. And some people want to dodge that, the text's impact by, by watering it down so that only those who trust in their riches fall under Jesus' condemnation here. It's true, of course. Jesus does not command all his followers to sell all their possessions and give to the poor. Some of his disciples retained homes, boats, tools of their livelihood. Joseph of Arimathea was a man of wealth and a follower of Jesus. Luke refers to prominent women who supported Jesus' ministry, something that would be impossible for them to do if they had sold everything and given to the poor, right? Uh, after Zacchaeus announced that he's giving half, not everything, giving half of his possessions to the poor and repaying fourfold anyone he's defrauded. Jesus announces what? Salvation has come to him. In Acts, the early church had wealthy members who gave generously, but also retained a portion of their wealth. And so I'm saying this, that the, these passages show the early church was neither communist nor communal in that sense. Jesus did not require this of everyone. And as I say that, if you breathe a sigh of relief, don't. We're the ones to whom Jesus is speaking in this passage. In other words, this is for all of us. And before we dismiss this passage as for others, or we think, oh man, so-and-so needs to... No, we need, we need to hear it. We need to see it. We need to read it. We need to see it in all of Scripture. 
which clearly teaches time and time again the seductive and destructive power of riches, uh, the need to uh, reach out generously with what God has given us to, to, to help those in needs. And we must absolutely know that nothing we do for ourselves can ever earn eternal life. It's only through faith in God's gift of grace coming like a dependent child that we can be saved. And yet those who invest only in themselves, invest only in their security, in their own comfort, in their own pleasure, need to know you're making a bad investment. You know, the, the danger of wealth is a leading theme throughout Jesus' teaching, especially in Luke's gospel. Uh, in Luke's gospel, in addition to uh, blessings for the poor, he pronounces woes against the rich and the powerful. Uh, the story of the rich man and Lazarus illustrates the great reversal that's going to come to the rich who ignore the needs of the poor. The parable of the rich fool relates the fate of those who store up things for themselves but are not rich toward God. Riches, wealth, material things are dangerous because they bring superficial contentment and ease. They distract us from what's truly important. They distract us from what's of eternal value. Because as Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and money. Uh, wealth also tends to breed sins of selfishness, right? Like pride and greed and coveting. Paul once again points to the fleeting nature of riches to their destructive power. As he writes to Timothy, he says, We have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Do you think the rich young ruler longed for it, wandered away? You know, it's difficult to, to strip ourselves of whatever provides our security in life, right? And yet, who is our trust in? Who is our faith in? The, the story is told of a, a rich man who, who stood up in church one day and he recounted how God had blessed him in remarkable ways. And he told how he, as a young man, he was sitting in church after he'd received his first small paycheck from his first job. And as the offering plate was coming toward him, a small voice inside him was saying, give it all, give it all to God. He resisted at first, but the voice persisted until he signed the check over and dropped it in the offering plate. He explained to the congregation that from that point on, God had blessed him immeasurably and that he'd become a wealthy man. After he sat down, a dear old lady sitting behind him leaned forward and whispered in his ear, I dare you to do it again. <laughs> How hard it is for those who have been given so much by God to relinquish it all for his use. No Christian is immune from the danger of wealth and possessions. None of us. Covetousness in the soul begins to slowly work its destruction. The, the love of acquiring things and an appetite for self-gratification deadens the desire for self-sacrifice. It promotes self-sufficiency, not Christ-sufficiency. And, and, and so if riches are not the goal of life, if riches are not the holy grail of life, what are they for? Well, they're God's resources entrusted to us to accomplish his purposes, right? That includes caring for the poor, reaching out to those in need. I mean, Jesus proclaimed the gospel as good news to the poor and freedom for the oppressed, right? Jesus, uh, while he was here on earth, fed the multitudes. He cared for the sick. He pronounced blessings on the poor because they're recipients of God's grace. The early church consistently met the needs of their own, reaching out to the widows, sharing resources. And so essential for every Christian is the principle of being a good steward of what God has entrusted to us. Everything we have is his and should be used for his purposes. Everything we have is a sacred trust from God. Now, dare I, I, I make enemies and step on toes? Before making purchases, we need to ask, how is this going to help accomplish God's purpose on earth? Have you ever asked yourself that? 
With this investment, am I seeking God's kingdom or my own selfish desires? What am I promoting here? And so while the dangers of riches and the importance of good stewardship are our important application in this passage, it begins and ends with the fundamental question of eternal life. The rich man believed that, that his obedience was complete. He wanted confirmation from Jesus to make sure that he had eternal life, but Jesus teaches that salvation is beyond human power to achieve. I mean, on the surface, this man had everything. He was a good man. He was a gifted man. He was a wealthy man, but Jesus makes it clear that that wasn't enough. And Jesus doesn't speak out of anger at the man's wealth or his greed or his self-righteousness. No, he doesn't do that. He speaks rather out of what? A deep love for the man. A desperate concern for the man's destiny. And he sees that this man has made wealth his God. And only a radical surgery can cure that cancer. And so Jesus tells him to give it all away. And then God's grace would be able to transform him. He must give up everything. He must give up his whole life. He must follow Jesus. I mean, the command to sell everything is, is equivalent to Jesus' earlier command to his disciples to deny themselves, right? Take up their cross and follow Jesus. Same thing. Salvation doesn't come from human effort. It comes through the rejection of ourselves, the complete dependence on God and what he has done. It's becoming a child. And salvation, though it costs us nothing, costs us everything, right? And so this event prepares us for Jesus' soon announcement to his disciples that he is going to give his life as a ransom for me. And what Jesus offers doesn't depend on what people do for themselves, but on what's done for them. No one enters the kingdom of God by their own strength. Giving oneself over completely to God seems impossible. But Jesus didn't need to die on a cross for something that everyone finds easy, right? Following Jesus, which leads to salvation, doesn't depend on our human ability. It doesn't depend on our possessions. It comes from the one who makes all things possible. And so those that have possessions, and we all have possessions, may find coming under God's rule difficult because they think they have so much to lose. But God requires the same thing of everyone, rich and poor. Fishermen, toll collector, prosperous landowners, destitute, day labor, it doesn't matter. All must do what? Give up whatever stands in the way of total commitment to following Jesus. The rich who reject Jesus will be spiritually poor forever, right? But on the other hand, those who forsake everything to follow him receive eternal riches. Those who store up their treasures in heaven understand the truth expressed by the, the missionary, the martyr Jim Elliot, when he said, a familiar statement, you've all heard it. Quote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose, right? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let's bow together. Father, we come before you acknowledging the truth of your word. Father, we realize that we all at times depend on things other than you. We find our security in our possessions or in our bank account or, or whatever it might be. Father, forgive us for these sins. Allow us to give up everything for you, to use what you have entrusted us for your glory. Father, may we not become a, a people who are uh, worshiping the idol of, of wealth and possessions, but, Father, that we would worship you first and foremost and always. Father, help us to be followers of Jesus. Help us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and follow him daily. Father, we pray that as we think on these things, as we read your word, that your spirit might continue to convict us where necessary, encourage us, and, Father, that we might become more Christ-like each and every day. Help us to be a church that cares for the needs of those within our body that we would take care of one another as you have commanded us to do. And through this, may you be honored and glorified and draw people to yourself. We ask these things in your name. Amen.